Let's start with the desk. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this desk. It's just an Argosy, I think it's called a Dual 15K. I got it in like 1999, I think. Back in the day, it had, you know, if you go on Argosy's site, they've got many different versions. And it had a cutout for a keyboard. And then initially I had the, the taller racks that had four more rack spaces. I changed out the tops to, I think they call it the mastering version. I've customized it so many times over the years. I cut out the uh, keyboard tray so that I could put a, I built a stand underneath. I had such a heavy keyboard for years that bounced when you played right. it and I didn't like that. So I built a really solid, this is not going anywhere. It's anchored to that. Nice. So it's actually not touching the, the Argosy at all. And then I put this on a slide out tray so that if I'm working on something other than music, I can lean in and, and you know, do it or when I'm mixing. Last year, I, I built this whole little center thing because I wanted to have my main mic pre right there so I could actually make adjustments while I'm tracking, you know, vocal and, you know, it's warm, warm audio. I mean, it, they're, they're yeah, doing but, a lot of... Yeah, but these mic pre's, I shot them out with some Neves yeah. and it was like, couldn't say which one yeah. was which. I love the features of this one. Oh, it's yeah. really unique because everything's right here. You've got two front panel versions. Did you label the buttons? I did. What are these limiters? So those are uh, Golden Age. They're LA-2As in an LA-3A chassis. Whoa. There's actually even an, an extra um, tube socket in there. So you can swap out tubes. You can do some really cool experimenting. But at the end of the day, I love the sound of them. And then you have this, is this the X-Touch? Right? Yep, that's the X-Touch standard. And then this is the X-Touch Compact, which is anything but. I don't know why they call it compact. But I use this one for, for logic, for any automation. This one I dedicated strictly for virtual instrument programming. There's two layers. You got an A and, and B layer. When I'm working with sample libraries, doing like film scoring stuff, it's important to have, you know, seven or eight different controllers, but you got two layers of it. Everything must serve a purpose, I mm -hmm. imagine, Everything right? does. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm looking at three MacBooks. Yes. And then a second monitor. That's tied to a PC down in the corner. So when I'm doing a big film scoring project, which I actually don't do a lot of those lately, I did, I was up to five computers at one point, all networked through Vienna Ensemble Pro, which is, right. Michael Whitaker talked about that in, in the video you did with him. So this kind of lets you be modular. Like I've got 64 gig of RAM in here and four solid state drives, but it lets me, I, I think there's, I forget how many instruments I've got loaded, but there's four or 500 instruments just in this one machine and it's all getting piped via ethernet into my main Mac, which is the, the MacBook Pro, which this one's only a, I think it's a 2018, 2019. Okay. I went with a laptop because I typically do a lot of touring and I wanted to be able to take work on the road with me. When I'm home, it plugs into this little CalDigit dock, which is genius. And that little dock runs pretty much the whole studio. It's uh, called Cal CalDigit. Cal mm -hmm. It's called a TS3 Plus. Under here, I've got a four bay solid state array, which all my samples are hosted on that, yep. uh, my media drives. So when I come home, I literally just plug in the laptop and then it it connects to the entire studio. I was just gonna ask about this console, but I think I just figured it out. Are all the keyboards going through that? Yeah, it's basically a sub mixer, especially with some of the older synths like the, the DX7 and, and stuff like that. And this guy, Arturia, the uh, Matrix Brute, it's analog and yeah. it's, it's pretty noisy. Yeah. which is just part of the character of it. So what I do is I run all the synths pretty much into here and then everything is gain optimized. So everything is, you know, your gain structure is set up properly. I've got noise gates on every channel so that nothing is making any hiss or noise when it's not sure. being used. And then I'm going ADAT light pipe from here into my Apollo, which is in the rack. Yeah, so the main Apollo is down there. I never really have to touch this thing. It's really just a glorified Plug and patch play. bay. Yeah. yeah. This is the Mark II, uh, 96K version of the O2R, which still sells for about nine grand. Found it for 500 bucks. If I'm understanding this right, you got console, UA console. Yeah. Uh, probably has yep. some channels just open. You could walk up yep. to a synth and, yep. and hear it. So I've got a, a dedicated send return loop set up where anything in here can get routed through my hardware chain. When I want to commit it and, and track it, I'll do that typically. And I've got a couple open channels on the Apollo. So the stuff I really care about, like the analog stuff, I want to get every ounce of it. I'll, I'll run it through the through the hardware. And and then you've got this, uh, some pedals over here. Is yeah. this for reamping? No, so these, I'm a 
reverb junkie. And I'm always, I've got way too many reverbs and typically they're all in the box. But somebody, I forget what it was. Well, the, the Big Sky, of course, is a big deal. Everybody loves the, the Big Sky. But the one that really got me, this maybe two years ago, is this, the Specular Tempest. For really atmospheric, dreamy stuff, I don't think I've ever heard a better reverb than that. So if you're not using a reamp thing through it, what what's it going through to come out of the interface so, into it? Basically just a send return loop from the Apollo. So I've got one pair of the Apollo like outputs. Like line out? Line outs going into these EbTech line level shifter. Oh, okay. take it, They take it from minus 10 or from plus four balanced to minus 10. Got so it. that it matches the level that that wants to see. Those EbTech boxes are great. They don't do anything sonically. They just convert level from unbalanced to balanced. And so you've got like a few small guys up here. Are these that you're using often? I had surgery on my hands a couple years ago for trigger finger. A couple decades of pounding on weighted action keyboards. Yeah. There's a reason to have 88 keys, weighted keys when I'm playing piano stuff. I'm a piano player. If I'm just quickly auditioning sounds and I don't yeah. want to be playing a weighted keyboard, it's just nice to have these. A controller that's ideal for me, it's this Korg D1. It's a digital piano that happens to be low profile. It's thin. The action is weighted, but it's not super heavy. So yeah. I can actually play faster stuff like when I'm scoring playing string parts and whatnot, but it has no pitch and mod wheels. It's just a digital piano. Nice. So I'm like, oh, let me grab a little Arturia or this little Korg. I've got pitch and mod wheels right here on my desktop so I can play from any keyboard. They all yeah. get routed into, you know, Logic. And then what's this guy? Streaming mixer. Yeah, oh yeah, Roland. So yeah, it's a broadcast mixer. It takes four HDM or three HDMI inputs from three cameras or, you know, whatever your sources are. It's got two uh, mic pre's and let's you it's a switcher you know you can switch between your your any any of your sources and stream straight to whatever youtube facebook instagram i thought you were talking about the stream decks those things are absolutely bonkers you know they instantly change to whatever your foreground app is like when i'm in email like i've got a button that types my email address which is ridiculously long yeah i never type my email address i just hit a button so you've got you know your software kind of piped in here mm -hmm. and then is that that's also going that's what we're seeing over here on the ipad what this does is it gives you hands-on control for everything you see on screen so you so can you have your presets for sort of designed for the specific sound yep. of the song yep as a reference and then you have the controls on the ipad right it's like having a virtual mix console right under your fingertips right. without having to mess with your software and then what's the one underneath it is that even that's, more controls that one is for when um Typically more when I'm deep into logic uh, for my scoring template. What's like, the app? The app is called Touch OSC. Basically Tinker Toys. I mean, you can you can create any kind of controller, whether it's it, both of these are running Touch OSC. That's the main screen for for Backstage Pass. It gives me 24 program change buttons. What's called B3 Designer. I can dial in all my B3 stuff, like how much distortion I want. This is the main screen for DX Streams, and then I've got another screen for like a channel strip editor. Like this one would be for a synth, like attack, decay, sustain, release, basic envelope controls, a thing called atmosphere, which kind of is a third hand. I can trigger a note. If I want to hold a pad sound during a transition, I can hit that and it'll it'll hold that for me and play whatever note I specify. I just hit, say I'm in the key of F. I hit the F and then turn it on. It'll hold an F with whatever pad sound I've got called F. Interesting. Yeah, the, the worship guys love that. Like worship teams, it, it's a big thing for them. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's, you can do anything with Touch OSC.